I'm talking with Greg Hill. You may have seen his name recently because Greg was named International Educator of the Year by the World Affairs Council. And we were supposed to have a luncheon honoring you, Greg, on, on March 31st. But uh, the way things are, I think we're going to have to postpone that at least until the, until the Malin dinner. But I know that our listeners would be very interested in what's going on now with all of your students at Dr. John Horn High School in the Mesquite ISD. Well, first of all, uh, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be recognized by the council. Uh, we're in what I call the new not normal uh, with me and my students where we've uh, migrated to a digital uh, campus uh, using what's commonly known as distance learning. So through uh, tools like Zoom, which we're using now in Google Classroom, uh, I'm able to still connect with my students and teach them uh, just like almost like as if we were in the classroom. I'm so impressed that I've been seeing a number of teachers doing this on, on, you know, on, on TV. They're reporting about it. H have you done a lot of this before or as part of your training uh, with the ISD or some of the wonderful uh, extra training that you've done? Was, was this part of the curriculum? Well, um, I do use Google Classroom as a way for kids. Um, it's a great way for kids that are absent to kind of stay abreast on what's missing. Um, platforms like Zoom, I I'm able to use in various uh, professional developments. I also use it in my work with uh, the Qatar Foundation International, uh, with some other groups I consult with um, on a daily basis. Um, that way we won't necessarily have to be face to face. Um, I also use it to uh, communicate with friends uh, overseas in Germany and Morocco and other places. Uh, allows us to not uh, burn up our uh, data on our cell phones. It's kind of a better alternative. Do all of your students have uh, computers and good internet connections? Well, that is a really big problem. Uh, we are a growing Title I campus um, at Horn High School. Um, and we, today, just today, we had 500 uh, families show up to get uh, Chromebooks uh, because they lacked um, that infrastructure. Uh, we've also kind of directed them. A couple of companies like Comcast and, and others have uh, given uh, students 60 days of free internet, and we had several uh, families that are participating in that program. Where did the Chromebooks come from? They come from our, uh, and, uh, our inventory we have at school. So we've gone from the traditional uh, computer labs. We have one dedicated computer lab that's dedicated for like computer students that want to take computer science. Um, so what we've done, and since we, we were close to 3,000 students, each uh, core teacher, math, science, social studies, and English, each has a bank of 35 Chromebooks that they can use in their classes. And so instead of going down to a dedicated computer lab, the computer lab is right there. Are you following the regular schedule that you would follow as if school were in session on campus? We're trying to the best of our ability. Um, we have a, our principal, Mr. Bruce Perkins, has set up uh, a schedule kind of similar to what we follow uh, at school where kids get 30 minutes with a teacher uh, in a designated time slot. Um, that's not always feasible for some kids for a variety of reasons. Um, that's why we kind of become, and the, the catchphrase now is being flexible and giving grace to kids. Um, so I, you know, if a kid can't make it to my dedicated 1A hour, they can certainly come to the 2A hour or, or even afterwards, they can contact me through a variety of ways. There's been some discussion I've read in the paper about uh, moving away from grades during this period and having pass fail. Is that something you're doing or is it under consideration? Well, I've heard that in other districts and other and some of my colleagues in other states, but for us at Horn High School, one of the main thing for us is to make sure our, especially our seniors, um, getting those that academics, getting those uh, the, at least some semblance of school so that it can count under TEA rules. Uh, part of the rules are Excuse we have- me, we have people listening from all over. So TEA, what is oh, that? Oh, I'm sorry, Texas Education Agency. Uh, which is the governing body for uh, public schools and charter schools in the state of Texas. Um, for us to continue to 
not have for us not to use uh, extra time after our calendar ends, we have to provide that uh, learning experience, even in a distance learning format. And so that is our biggest fear. We're, we don't want to get to a case we're hearing in other states where this, this semester may not count for students. I think that would do the kids a disservice. Have you all made a decision yet, a determination of when you'll go back to school, or are you already now knowing that you will not go back this semester? Tentatively, our, uh, our extended spring break uh, will end on April the 3rd. I know that's a technical term. Um, our uh, school board will meet on March the 30th to determine if we need to extend that even further. Um, but judging just based on some of the things I've been reading and researching, um, that, could, that could go even farther into May. How do you think this will affect applications to college? That's a really good question. Um, I think it's going to hamper uh, college applications. I know a lot of students even before we went on spring break, uh, the second week of March, were scrambling to get uh, college, college applications in. Some were getting college acceptances. Um, so it's kind of, to me, I see it as a two-way street and it'll hurt both applications, but also with matriculations as well. You know, how is this going to hurt uh, students who maybe got into a Harvard or maybe got into a uh, SMU or some other school, would this change their mind? How are your students holding up? Well, a lot of my students really miss going to school, believe it or not. They miss um, the routine. They miss knowing at a certain time they have to be at a certain spot. Um, I mean, just like a lot of us, they, they're starting to get cabin fever. Um, there are some that are, to be honest with you, that are really upset with the coronavirus, feeling that it's really infringing. Uh, on their education. Um, of course, there's others that are, hey, this is a great deal. I need a break. I needed that extra week. Um, and, 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 and this is a really trying time for some who are just really having a hard time psychologically with dealing uh, with the whole situation of being out of school. Do you think they understand the gravity? And do you th believe that most of your students are abiding by the county's guidelines of shelter in place? I, I believe so. This is something we've been tracking since it, it spawned in Wuhan, China. Uh, every 10, the first 10 minutes of the day of every class, uh, I stand talking about global uh, issues. And when it first, ex I hate to use the term exploded, but first kind of uh, showed its head in Wuhan, uh, we were talking about it, we were discussing it. And, you know, at the time we really didn't think, oh, you know, okay, this is, this is something in China, this is something you really didn't think it was gonna get here. But of course, through globalization and our interconnectedness, which we talked about in my class, it, it got here. Greg, what are you most concerned about? What's, what's, what's your biggest challenge right now? My biggest challenge um, or my biggest concern is the well-being of my students, um, as well as my own biological children who are in college, uh, respectively. Uh, to make sure that they, first of all, are they, their social and emotional states, are they okay? The second is making sure that they know that by following the guidelines that our uh, elected leaders and our medical professionals are putting out, that we will come out of this if we just follow those, basically like school, if you follow the rules, you'll be okay. Well, let's shift gears for a minute because indeed you are a remarkable educator. You graduated from SMU in 1997 with a degree in liberal arts. Uh, stated as, well, no, let's see, you graduated with a, a BA in sociology and then a master's in liberal arts in uh, what, a year later or at the same time? Uh, no, it was um, a couple of years later. Um, and you're kind of going to co coincide with me going back to coach football at SMU. So uh, while there, I was like, wait, might as well get a master's while I'm here. When did you decide you wanted to be a teacher and what created your focus in uh, politics and geography and, and, and so forth? Well, it's kind of ironic because my mo mother was a teacher for over 40 years and, and just seeing the struggle that she had, you know, as a, as a kid, I was like, I'd never want to be a teacher. Uh, but working in corporate America and working in, in shortly after college, um, my high school football coach, Freddie James, called me and said, hey, I need a coach. And I said, you know what? I think I could do that. And I gave it a shot. And I said, I like this teaching gig. I like talking to kids. 
I like being a, a positive role model uh, on them. So that's when I really got the coaching bug um, and teaching bug. And so uh, after coaching at SMU, I went back into high school teaching, uh, teaching world history. And um, it wasn't until Ronnie Pardon, who was the principal at the time at Warren High School, called me and said, hey, I'm looking for a good geography teacher. And I said to myself, well, sir, I, I teach history. And, he's, and he says, um, you don't understand. I'm looking for a good geography teacher, and you're my guy. And so I said, okay, I can do anything for a year. Let's go try the geography thing out. And I started researching as much as I can about teaching geography. And I just fell in love with it. Um, and, and from then on, I just wanted to be uh, this globally literate citizen and pass it on to my students. Well, one of the things that stands out in your background is how much you've traveled, as well as how many articles you've written. Tell us about some of these uh, study abroad that you've been able to do. Well, uh, fortunately for me, I've been able to, one, travel with the council to Morocco. Um, that was a really eye-opening experience. Uh, I've been to Germany with the Transatlantic Outreach Program, uh, which included a homestay with a wonderful German family. Uh, I've gone on a Fulbright to the Andes with Ohio State University, studying Andean culture and deeply immersed in learning Quechua and Quechua. Um, and I've also been able to go to uh, countries like Korea, Japan, um, and, and really just enriched my teaching. One of the things that I, I'm so uh, impressed by and grateful, uh, your Junior World Affairs Council chapter is such a strong one. We have now, I guess, over 70 throughout the Metroplex, but, but yours stands out. Why do your students in, enjoy it so much? Well, my students enjoy it because it, it's really eye-opening. And I think one of the things that really stands out, for example, I have students that come in as like, oh, I'm just gonna be a, a doctor. I don't need to know about this global stuff. And then when we start presenting issues that pertain to the health field, or we, you know, somebody's like, oh, I'm going to be a lawyer. And it's like, well, there's, there's, there's legal ramifications for being a global citizen. Uh, that really gets them excited. And, and the biggest thing is when we take them to the World, Event, uh, World Affairs Council events, where they can sit next to uh, some of the movers and shakers in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. They can meet people like Ben Carson or General Petraeus and others. Um, that really, like, sparks an interest in them. Well, I feel the same way when we get to do that as well. And I know that opportunities like this are, are given not just at our council, but with other councils throughout the United States. Greg, it's, it's great seeing you. Your students sure are lucky. And thanks for giving us your insight about what it's like right now uh, through, this, through this pandemic. Thanks again. I for want to thank you as well. And I appreciate it.